Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you all for coming to the spring installment of our 11th annual McCarthy Lecture Series. And thank you, as always, to our Dale Center supporters, particularly Dr. Richard McCarthy and Dr. Craig Howard, whose continued generosity to the Dale Center allows us to bring to Hattiesburg esteemed guests such as our speaker tonight, who is not just uh, the president of the flagship International Military History Society, but also one of the top scholars in military history coming all the way from Australia. So we're, again, very grateful to the continue, continued support of Dr. McCarthy, Dr. Howard, and all of our Dale Center supporters. Um, it's a real privilege to be able to introduce Dr. Jeffrey Gray, the newly minted president of the Society for Military History. Dr. Gray is Professor of History at the University of, South, of New South Wales, Canberra, and a leading scholar known for his expertise on Australian and comparative and international military history. He's the author or editor of over 20, 20 well-respected books, including Australia's Vietnam War, which is excellent, um, the Oxford Companion to Australian Military History, as well as numerous articles, book chapters, and reviews. Professor Gray has served as the editor of the journal War and Society, as parliamentarian and trustee for the Society of Military History, and as the, ma the Major General Matthew C. Horner Chair of Military Theory at the Marine Corps University in Quantico, Virginia. Dr. Gray currently serves as a member of the Army History Research Grant Schemes Committee and Army Historical Advisory Committee of the Australian Army, and an adjunct senior Senior Research Fellow at the Land Warfare Studies Center, also of the Australian Army. As President of the Society for Military History, he oversees the most important scholarly organization in the field of military history with over 2,500 members worldwide. Dr. Gray's talk, A Great War of Empire, Britain, the Ottomans, and the Campaign in the Middle East, 1914 to 1918, is drawn from his recently published book, The War with the Ottoman Empire, uh, by Oxford University Press. So please join me in giving a warm welcome to Dr. Jeffrey Gray. Thank you very much for that very generous uh, introduction. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, as Heather indicated, uh, I am no stranger to the United States. I've lived here several times, worked here for several years with the Marines. Um, and have visited often for a variety of reasons. Uh, this is the first time I've gotten quite this far south. Um, <laughs> although I have uh, wandered around the southern states on numerous occasions, uh, I find the south a truly fascinating place, and I, uh, for all the right reasons, and, uh, <laughs> I thoroughly enjoy being, being down here. Uh, so thank you very much for the, for the invitation to, to come along and speak in this distinguished program this evening. I'm going to do a number of things uh, in the, the lecture this evening, um, which, as Heather said, is, is drawn fairly lightly from a book I published a couple of months ago in a series I'm editing to mark the centenary of the Great War in Australia. That's the one that begins in 2014 and ends in 2019. In this country, of course, it begins in 2017, so you could be forgiven for not being aware it's still a couple of years to come. But for the rest of us, uh, it's been a big show in town since last year um, when it, it kicked off. And I want to do several things. I'm going to discuss a little bit of the received version of the historiography of the war and how the Middle Eastern theatres fit into that. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the operations in that part of the war in the context of the war as a whole, or at least the context of the British Empire's war as a whole. And along the way, I want to challenge a few orthodox beliefs about the empire and the war effort, how the British ran it, and how the dominions of which Australia, New Zealand, Canada, South Africa, and, and uh, Newfoundland were the constituent parts, uh, related to each other and benefited or not from their participation. And as part of that, I want to talk a little bit uh, about the question of the use and utility of cavalry. Uh, because this is one of a number of theatres where its continuing utility in modern industrial warfare circa 1418 uh, raises some interesting questions also about how that subject has been treated in the historiography of the war. Uh, 
So, let's begin. And, and I'm Australian. Uh, my language is history. Uh, my, dialogue, my dialect is British and the Empire. There will be occasionally times where I maybe appear to be speaking in tongues. Um, I apologise for that in advance. There's a certain amount of assumed a priori knowledge or name recognition here, uh, which I'm very happy to expand upon and, and explain uh, in the discussion period at the end, and I promise there will be plenty of time left for that. Historical writing in English on the Great War suffers from a number of limitations and possesses some defining characteristics which, taken together, have resulted in a prolonged adolescence in the genre which has only recently begun to break down. The centenary of the war offers opportunities to widen and improve popular understanding of the conflict, its course and conduct, but much of what will be published over the next four years, alas, is likely to reinforce the less desirable traits which have long been manifest within it. Whilst the decades-long obsession with the Western Front in British historiography has diminished understanding of other theatres and the symbiotic relationships between them, it has nonetheless greatly aided our detailed understanding of the ways in which the war was fought in that theatre, especially as a result of the so-called revisionist work of the last 40-odd years. I'm not sure how long you've got to go on being revisionist until you're no longer revisionist and you've become the orthodox. <laughs> Whether one fully subscribes to the notion of the learning curve and associated analysis which is at its heart, the fact remains that the study of the British armies in France and Belgium is immensely richer and more varied than was once the case. And it is much more difficult to advance and maintain most of the tired old cliches about British generals, the fighting qualities of the armies, the alleged superiority of Dominion forces, and a host of others that once held sway, undiminished by even a nodding acquaintance with fact. Some popular cultural beliefs remain impervious to reasoned, evidence-based argument. Anything to do with Douglas Haig heads that list. But there can be little question that the historiographical landscape is immensely richer and better developed than was the case when the, long, when the late John Terrain began his valiant and often lonely campaign to overturn a half century's accumulated nonsense about the reality of the war in the early 1960s. The relentless focus on the Western Front, positive in its own terms as I've suggested, has meant, however, that other theatres and other aspects of the Great War have often not received the beneficial scrutiny of the revisionist wave. With the exception of the Dardanelles campaign of 1915, which, as you may know, is obsessively, obsessively privileged in the historical writing in Australia and New Zealand, the war against the Ottoman Empire falls squarely into this category. Although this has begun to change in the last decade through the efforts of mostly younger scholars, the various theatres in the Middle East and Eastern Mediterranean remain poor cousins historiographically. Especially in the Antipodean narratives, the war is characterized by a sentimental nostalgia for the mounted units and a grossly simplified and romanticized retelling, which effectively divorces these theaters of the war from their contemporary context and regards them as something other than operations of modern industrial warfare. The jacket illustration of the book is of a light horse uh, subunit in 1918. It is chosen very deliberately because there is not a single horse there. <laughs> In British accounts, Lord Allenby looms justifiably large, but this often results in a dismissal of his predecessor, General Murray, while the Dardanelles campaign distracts historical attention from the earlier defense of Egypt and the Canal under the first wartime GOC, Maxwell, who I would argue, laid the foundations on which others subsequently built. He's not the first example of a, a general officer early in a long war who comes to be treated with disdain by posterity. The campaign in Sinai in 1916 is usually treated in passing, and there is little attempt to see the interconnectedness of the various theatres, Egypt itself, Sinai, Mesopotamia, the Dardanelles, Salonika, the Hejaz, Palestine, and the significant Russian theatres in the Caucasus and Central Asia, 
and the interplay between them. This is why I titled the book The War with the Ottoman Empire, to help to emphasize the multiplicity of theatres that that simple one-line description actually covers and perhaps somewhat conceals. The missing dimension is consideration of the Ottomans themselves. Our knowledge of the Ottoman military is shallow and incomplete, and our understanding of the impact of the war on the Ottoman Empire's constituent societies is no better. The recent observation of a leading young Turkish historian, and I quote him, that the material and environmental devastation caused by the war has never been assessed, and the war's civilian experience has still not been studied in any detail, could apply to no other major combatant <coughs> power of the Great War. <coughs> there are a number of significant structural problems that help to explain this. The relevant archives have only been opened to public access in the recent past. The organization and language of the records and their finding aids reflects Ottoman bureaucratic practice and both are subjects of study in their own right. While fluency in written Ottoman Turkish, a different language and a different script from modern Turkish, is fairly rare even among Turkish historians. Military history is not a recognized field within Turkey's university system and few historians work in it, although this is changing amongst a mostly younger generation of scholars based both in Turkey and outside the country's borders. Nor has the relevant official history running to 27 volumes been translated into English or any other modern European language. In many key respects, the British War with the Ottomans confirms trends and developments in other theatres, including the Western Front. The differences between them are sometimes more apparent than real. The excessive emphasis on the mounted units in Palestine helps to obscure the fact that at its height, the Egyptian Expeditionary Force also contained two infantry corps, which disposed of seven divisions, as opposed to the three, ultimately four, mounted ones in the Desert Mountain Corps. The British deployed tanks, armoured cars, heavy artillery, chemical weapons, and air power in support of these formations. And the sense of cooperative interaction between the arms and services not only never disappeared, but became more evident as the war went on. At the tactical and operational levels, in both planning and execution, combined arms warfare was the reality of fighting in the Middle East, and maneuver and mobility remained key determinants of success on both sides. The Middle East was the second most important theatre of operations in the British effort throughout the war. Enemy success on the Western Front would pose the most direct existential threat to the British home islands, and it made complete sense for those who understood strategy to advocate the primacy of France and Flanders over any, and indeed every, other theatre. The simplistic characterization of <coughs> Easterners and Westerners in the formulation of London's war strategy often downplays the essential truth while at the same time assuming greater coherence to British deliberations than was perhaps the case. Equally overlooked is the fact that successive commanders in Egypt, from Maxwell to Allenby, all understood the necessity of giving priority to the Western Front over their own needs and operated with those assumptions and limitations firmly in mind. They could not have done otherwise. It is also worth noting that the greatest demands upon the command in Egypt in the critical and sometimes dangerous years of the first half of the war came not from London, but for, at least not directly, but from fronts such as the Dardanelles and Salonika, whose forces had been under-resourced for the tasks assigned them, and whose shortfalls were then made the responsibility of the GOC, Egypt, to be met from his existing resources, such as they were. The importance of the theatre and the reality of the Ottoman threat to Britain's position in the region were fully appreciated, not least by that old Egypt hand and Secretary of State for War, Lord Kitchener. But the voracious demands for both manpower and materiel occasioned by the war meant that none of the major combatants was able to fully resource all the theatres in which they were committed, and certainly not simultaneously. Viewed in this way, 
the British war effort overall is more commendable, I think, than is sometimes acknowledged. The defence of its imperial position in Egypt was fundamental to British strategy in the Middle East during the Great War, largely for reasons of prestige and fear of the likely impact elsewhere in the empire, which is code for India, of a reverse... <laughs> <coughs> Contemporary correspondents would often use the code. They talk about it. our standing in the empire. They always meant India. But it was better to universalise the problem than to particularise it. The likely impact elsewhere in the empire of a reverse to Britain's position within the Muslim world. But that threat was real is encapsulated in this photograph, which is of members of the German and Austrian military missions with their Ottoman uh, army staff. Uh, it's one small part of, of what ultimately became quite a sizable and very focused effort on the part of the central powers. While continuing control of the Suez Canal and preservation of British investments was important, this was a lesser concern at least in terms of the immediate prosecution of the war. Troop ships aside, the distances and time involved and the pressure on shipping, together with the relatively underdeveloped state of industry, meant that unlike in the case of Canada, Australia and New Zealand played a fairly minor role economically in the underpinning of the Empire's war effort. And the war itself seriously retarded many Australian primary and extractive industries because they were unable to reach their traditional markets. On Gallipoli and in Palestine, the Ottomans did manage to subvert small numbers of Indian Muslim soldiers and prevail upon them to desert. And while the numbers were never large, the threat was a real one. The prospect of widespread disaffection in Egypt likewise was a cause of concern to Kitchener, as the eventual Egyptian rebellion in 1919 would demonstrate. In shorthand then, although it's sometimes suggested that the defence of the Suez Canal was somehow the primary focus of British strategy in this part of the world in this war, that is not in fact true. In subsequent periods, it becomes dominant. In 1418, it's not the major driver. The Dominions had no part in determining strategy during the Great War. Constitutionally, the defence and foreign policy powers resided in London, but in any case, neither Dominion governments nor their small military establishments had the experience or resources to contribute anything useful in this sphere, despite what subsequent generations of Australian historians would like to believe. <laughs> Australia's central contribution would be on the ground, as it was to be also in France and Flanders in the second half of the war. This was important, but needs to be seen in context as well. In the first part of the war, from late 1914, until the redirection of the Australian Infantry Divisions and the Kiwis to the Western Front in the first months of 1916, there were large numbers of Australian and New Zealand soldiers in Egypt who contributed little to the defence of Egypt beyond the purely symbolic. The forces actually dedicated to and capable of providing for the defence of the canal were never very numerous in this period, while the headquarters and support echelons were small in size and limited in capability. With the exception of the 29th Division, which merely transited through Egypt to and from the Dardanelles campaign, there were never in the First World War any British regular units or formations allocated to Egypt. The Antipodean mountain units were probably the dominant element in the force in the second half of 1916 during the campaign to clear Sinai. Though again, it needs to be remembered, especially by Australians, that while their quality and effectiveness varied, sometimes rather wildly, there was nonetheless another division's worth of mounted forces in yeomanry mounted units and three infantry divisions from the Territorial Army, together with artillery, the Imperial Camel, Camel Corps in brigade strength, flying corps squadrons, and so on. We too tend to focus upon the mounted units as though they're the only people in the theatre. You only have to look left and right of arc to see that they are a small, albeit at times significant, component of a very much larger whole. The diversity in troop type and national origin became more pronounced, not less, during the war's second half. At the same time, it is important to recognise that the Australian and New Zealand mounted units were one of the few stable elements of the Egyptian expeditionary force, in the sense that they were retained in Palestine 
throughout the war, despite attempts to divert them to the Western Front on several occasions, in the face of declining enlistments and staggering casualties. Pressures which themselves saw the EEF regularly plundered for British divisions for service in France. Murray had his most experienced infantry division, the 42nd, taken from him after Sinai was cleared of the enemy, even as he was being encouraged to push forward into southern Palestine, and had to make up the shortfall of the newly raised 74th Division, formed from dismounted yeomanry, i.e. mounted brigades, hurriedly converted to an infantry role, and lacking in artillery and other supporting arms and services, an infantry division on paper and in name only. Murray offered a pithy summation of his predicament, one which would have, could have been applied as equally to his predecessor Maxwell as to his successor Allenby. The policy at home is to take all they can possibly from me, leaving to hold on for the summer. I think they are right, though it's bad luck on me. At the same time as they withdraw my troops, they ask me to be as active as I can, so as to draw as many Turks as possible down into this theatre, and perhaps give them something to put in the papers during the dull season. <laughs> it is working on the principle of, we give you as little as we can, and take from you as much as we can, but should like and expect you to guard Egypt and to gain us some success. The War Office sought to make good by ordering the transfer of the 13th Division from Mesopotamia, or this would not in fact transpire, but rather spoiled that effort by ordering that it be stripped of its artillery, machine gun companies, and divisional transport for redirection to France. Again, a division more or less in name only after that had been done. This practice continued under Murray's successor, Allenby, if anything, in a heightened form in 1918. Much is often made of the fact that Allenby extracted reinforcements of men and equipment in both quantity and quality from Lloyd George, as part of his appointment in mid-1917. But it is all less often appreciated that he and his army did not enjoy this largesse for very long. He had insisted to London that he would not take the offensive in Palestine in what would become the Third Battle of Gaza without a core force of seven infantry and three mounted divisions. And he stuck to his guns in the face of considerable pressure. Those aren't his guns, by the way. Um, <laughs> Though they are, they are the British artillery pieces transferred uh, in the middle of the war. He reorganised the field force he inherited, splitting his six infantry divisions between two new, corps or, new, new two corps headquarters and confirming his three mounted divisions under the Desert Mounted Corps, command of which he invested in the Australian Harry Chevelle. By that point, Allenby had about 300,000 men under his command although this included the Campbell Transport Corps and very large numbers of local men in the Egyptian Labour Corps, a story which is largely unknown to audiences outside Egypt itself, so not all of them were effectives in any military sense. And with this army, he forced the defences of Gaza, where Murray had been twice defeated, and initiated a series of phased offensives that, by October 1918, would see the units of the EEF in Damascus, Aleppo, and Homs, and banging on the door of the shattered Ottoman defences of southern Anatolia. Described in this way, the campaign between October 1917 and October 1918 conveys a sense of purposeful, perhaps even of inevitable, progress and triumph. There was rather more to it than that. While he did relatively better in securing support in the short term than Murray had managed, Allenby never got everything he asked for, or everything he needed. His infantry divisions were of varied quality, a mix of territorial and new army, and like every theatre commander on the British side, he never had enough staff trained officers or sufficient numbers of competent and experienced regimental officers. As operations moved out of the deserts of Sinai, and once the capture of Gaza and the destruction of the enemy's fixed defensive line in southern Palestine, presented opportunities for manoeuvre and open mobile operations, Allenby agitated for good regular cavalry officers suitable for appointment as brigade majors and staff captains. Such, he told London, are essential with the amount of troops I have here. Now one might have assumed that cavalry officers were the one category which the British Expeditionary Force in France could spare. But the key, of course, 
was that what he wanted was staff trained regulars. And these were in high demand everywhere, regardless of their original branch of service. But why did he want them? The tendency to sentimentalise the light horse, as we call the mounted units in Australia, to elevate their charge at Beersheba as a precursor to the Third Battle of Gaza to a level of epic that it frankly cannot sustain, an inability to see that what was important about the mounted divisions of the EEF was not their horses per se, but the qualities of mobility and shock action which they made possible, means that many Australians fundamentally misunderstand the campaign in Palestine and Syria and underestimate the extent to which this was a theatre of modern war as that term was understood in 1917-18. Moreover, I would contend that it was one with more than passing similarity to the conduct of operations in France. At the end of 1916, and before the operations in Sinai had even concluded, one young Australian regular had argued that the light horse units must become cavalry if they wished to reap the full harvest of mounted action. Note there that the important part is mounted action, not the nature of the arm deploying it. His belief, based on his own unit's mounted action at Magdaba, was a little premature, but it would become the focus of intense discussion the following year. To this end, there was a partial issue of swords and instruction in their use in 1918. But even before this, they developed a growing appreciation that the mounted units needed to act and think more like cavalry and less like mounted infantry, that is, units which used strike in order to attain their objectives, rather than using their horses to get to a point where they then came in and acted like infantry on foot in order to close with their opponents. If they wanted to take advantage of the opportunities that were likely to come their way. As might have been expected, Major General Hodgson, a British cavalry officer with a regular background, commanding the Australian Mountain Division, favoured this idea. But perhaps more unexpectedly, so too did the Australian Chevelle. Not only had he welcomed the appointment of Allenby's suggestion of Brigadier Howard Vice, another staff trained regular cavalryman, to his senior operations staff, but in September 1917 he had requested changes to the course at the cavalry school at Saitun and the addition of a cavalry officer and two or three NCOs so that young officers of the mounted branches may be taught cavalry work. This discussion is a small part of a bigger issue concerning Dominion officers in the British Army in which they fought in the Great War. Chevelle would emerge from the war with his reputation greatly enhanced. He would go on to be Chief of the General Staff and Inspector General of the Australian Military Forces through most of the 1920s. He remains to this day the longest serving professional head of the Australian Army. Although his reputation in our time has been eclipsed a little by outlandish claims about that other Australian Corps commander, a chap called Monash, he stands at least equal in his accomplishments. Like Monash too, he was eager for preferment and recognition and had become embroiled over a rather nasty and probably not well advised exchange with Murray over the award of decorations after the Battle of Romani in 1916. His progression during the war was based, however, on merit and performance and his contemporaries, Australian and British alike, thought so too. At the same time, the War Office and British Theatre Commanders were well aware that the Australian Government insisted on Australians being appointed to command Australians whenever possible. And this was a strongly held preference on the part of the Australian Defence Minister, Senator George Foster Pearce. Indeed, it was his personal policy. There are a couple of points to make about all of this. The first is that the popular notion, alive and well in all of the dominions to this day, that the British were hell-bent on appointing British officers of dubious ability to commands over Dominion troops just because they could, is nonsense. The War Office was in fact very sensitive to the perception that older and unfit officers were given commands and did its best to ensure that this was not the case where the Dominion formations and units were concerned. In both commanders and staffs, the Dominion forces, all of them, <coughs> generally got the best available, and often in greater numbers than their counterparts in the British Territorial and New Army units, 
which were truly the ones who had to take what was left. It needs to be remembered as well that at the war's beginning there were just six staff qualified officers on the Australian establishment, and the number in the Canadian is not very much larger. While the most senior Australian officer, William Throsby Bridges, was only a major general, i.e. a divisional commander, and a very newly missing one at that. When Bridges was killed on Gallipoli, the British appointed Major General Gordon Legg to succeed him. And here's the key. Even though every senior Australian officer in the force objected that he was unfit for the command, and they overruled the commander of the Mediterranean Expeditionary Force, Ian Hamilton, who was inclined to listen to his Australian senior officers on the ground, precisely because Legg was the Australian government's nominee. And with that, there was to be no argument. As the British Empire armies expanded, which they did, of course, rapidly from the beginning of the war, in the first two years, the pressure to fill officer positions became even more pronounced. The Australians did not, at the war's outbreak, have sufficient staff officers to fill all the positions on the 1st Division headquarters. And by the early months of 1916, there were five Australian infantry divisions, most of a mountain division, and two corps headquarters to staff, while heavy casualties had been incurred among officers in particular on Gallipoli. The result was frequently accelerated promotion, which might, or might not, get the desired result. British regular officers could find themselves discharging functions in Dominion formations for which they had no experience, but at least they had a shared educational and training experience to draw upon as they did so. Serious military education and training in the Dominions, any of them, before 1914 was very limited, even for regulars like Chevelle, but even more so for officers in the various militias and part-time citizen forces, which were the mainstay of all of the Dominion armies at the outbreak of the war. Operational experience for the militia in particular was confined where it existed to the war in South Africa a decade and a half earlier, a war fought on a much smaller scale and with much lower applications of modern military technology. Those who survived their initial outings in command, of course, often grew into their roles and positions, but it was very much a case of learning while doing, and of being well qualified for the job only some time after one had assumed its responsibilities. This was the context in which Allenby made his senior appointments in the middle of 1917. Unlike either Hamilton or Murray, who had neither inherited their staff and commanders, or had been assigned them from London without any argument, Allenby was allowed at least some choice in making these appointments. Now, it's important to say at once, there was never any serious suggestion of removing Chevelle from his command. After all, his performance had not merited it, and in any case, and here was the deciding issue, Allenby was quite clear that the offence given to what he called Australian sentiment by such a change was simply not worthwhile and would not in any case be agreed to by London. That did not mean that the professional concerns that were held by senior British officers about some of their Dominion counterparts were not genuine. It is worth remembering that both Allenby and his senior cavalry uh, subordinate officer, Chetwood, had both served in the cavalry on active service in this war. It is worth remembering uh, that they had service in France uh, and that they were both regarded as serious-minded officers and serious trainers of the cavalry army. They knew their business, in other words. Chevelle, Chetwood said, was extremely steady and reliable in action, and he had no doubt that he would never lose his head and would always carry out his mission, particularly a defensive one, admirably. They had served together through the Sinai, so he had a basis for his judgment. The problem, as Chetwood saw it, was that well, Chevelle was, and I quote, no cavalryman, and is slow to grasp a situation and slower to act, that is offensively, and has the common propensity of preferring to tread on the tails of people's coats to using the speed of his horses and get on parallel lines with them, which is due, I think, to his possessing that very common failing of a horror of a gap between him and his friends. Chevelle possessed a capacity for self-awareness, and he knew that this was a professional shortcoming of his own. He admits it, at least implicitly, several times in his private correspondence. The concepts of mobility and manoeuvre were understood in different ways in this era in the mounted infantry and in the cavalry, reflected as well in many of the debates about the future of the mounted arm in the Edwardian British Army. 
of which all these officers had been acute readers and students. Allenby intended that the forthcoming operations against Gaza and the subsequent ones against Jerusalem should be both decisive and rapid, writing that success depends on surprise and speed. Events on the afternoon of 31 October 1917 before Beersheba seem to confirm the reservations often held of Chevelle. As he himself wrote later, if there was one lesson more than another I had learned at Magdala and Rafa in the Sinai, it was patience, and not to expect things to happen too quickly. At Beersheba, although progress was slow, there was never that deadly pause which is so disconcerting to a commander. I, I think he means that moment where he realises that he's lost the initiative. Allenby nonetheless issued a terse and very emphatic order as the afternoon drew on to capture Beersheba today. But at 6 p.m. the town and its defences were still in enemy hands. Lord Wavell, who of course would make his mark in a subsequent world war, and was subsequently the biographer of Allenby and serving as a senior officer on his headquarters, later wrote at this moment that methodical progress must be abandoned as too slow and that risks must be taken. The unleashing of the 4th Light Horse Brigade and the rapid mountain movement through the defences was precisely the sort of decisive action that Chetwood and Allenby were looking for. The rest, <coughs> as they say, or at least would subsequently, is history. Chevelle seems to have drawn the correct conclusions and perhaps gained in confidence following the taking of the town. In the great series of advances which followed the Battle of Megiddo in September 1918 and which brought about the utter defeat and ruination of the Ottoman armies in Palestine and Syria, the mounted divisions undertook what Chevelle himself described as, and as Americans and as Southerners you will enjoy this, a regular Jeb Stewart rather. <laughs> it's the first time in this war that the G in Gap has really come off, and I'm feeling very pleased with myself. And in case you're wondering how he knew about that, uh, the American Civil War was the small change of military history instruction uh, within the Dominion armies, and certainly within the Australian one, not only before the First World War, but indeed well after the end of the second. He had every reason to be pleased, but like so many other senior officers in this and every other theatre of the war, this was the culmination of some hard lessons combined with an attentive pupil. The contrast between this final offensive and the experiences earlier in the war was marked. Writing to his wife in late September, he described an extraordinary situation in which he found himself simultaneously fighting a battle at Baisan on the Jordan and one at Haifar on the Mediterranean at the same time, both of which were successful. McAndrew took Haifa yesterday and one of his brigades took Acre at the same time. He had some stiff fighting at Haifa and the Jodhpur lancers charged down the, st down the street spearing Turks with their lances. It's probably not seemly in our day and age to take quite so much delight in that, uh, in that observation. <laughs> Allenby had directed that Chevelle's command must press forward with the utmost energy. The cavalry corps must be ready to exploit their success as the situation demanded. Through such measures, <coughs> measures Chevelle fully repaid Allenby's confidence, and he and the mounted troops in his command, Australian, New Zealand, British, and by now large numbers of Indians, came fully into their own in the series of advances over great distances in which this theatre of the First World War culminated and ultimately ended. Wars rarely end neatly and great power wars almost never do so. The passage of the armistice in November 1918 marked merely the end of a phase of the conflict, albeit the end of a major phase. These are Turkish wounded and prisoners being taken to the rear guarded by British uh, soldiers. In significant ways, the Great War served a similar function for major and minor powers elsewhere. For countries as different as Ireland and Russia, the fighting continued into the early 1920s, while the consequences were felt for decades beyond that. The Ottomans were faced with partition and dismemberment under the terms of the Treaty of Sevres in 1920. But the outcome of the Turkish War of Independence saw that position abandoned and substantially revised with the Treaty of Lausanne in 1923. One might argue that the Turks were the only winners of the Great War among the losing nations. And it should be said, their outcome in retrospect looks a lot better than those accorded to such ostensible winners as the Czechs 
The war did not end in November 1918 for Australians either, or at least not for those Australians waiting for repatriation from the Middle East. The outbreak of the Egyptian rebellion in March, April 1919 saw light horse units engaged in security and pacification tasks in which small numbers of them were killed and which much larger numbers of Egyptians were killed or injured. The fact of the nature of Australian involvement as imperial enforcers did nothing to improve their standing in the eyes of the Egyptian population, a perception which remains in the Arab streets in Cairo to this day. By the end of the year, they were all gone in any case, and the problems of the post-war imperial settlement in Egypt and other former Ottoman territories became someone else's problem, at least for a while. The Ottomans ended the, entered rather, the Great War because they feared the consequences of not doing so. Their involvement on the side of the Central Powers was not inevitable, and the diplomatic record in the decade before the war shows regular attempts by Constantinople to secure an alliance with Britain in 1908, in 1911, and again in 1913. Moves which were largely frustrated by Russian geostrategic and French financial interests. German intentions towards the Empire in the years before 1914 were not benign either, a fact not lost on the Ottoman government. But the Ottomans' resultant diplomatic isolation offered them few viable options as the international order deteriorated. Despite the generally poor press that they attract in our time, the government of the Committee of Union and Progress, the CUP, known to posterity as the Young Turks, was bent upon the modernization of the Ottoman state and the preservation of the Ottoman Empire. Participation in the Great War doomed both. But it seems not unreasonable to ponder what the modern Middle East and much of the modern history of the world since at least 1945 might look like now had the Ottomans in fact maintained the neutrality which they announced in August 1914. Thank you. Thank you. 
and some of my historical college, historian colleagues will point to the fact that by 1914, Australia and New Zealand were the two most socially progressive, socially democratically inclined uh, countries in the developed Western world. And you can produce all sorts of statistics to, to demonstrate that about working hours, wage rates, um, infant mortality. Uh, we had a, a very heavily organized uh, legal uh, infrastructure which protected workers' rights uh, as well as, as those of, of employers and, and the nation corporate sector, and on and on and on. Uh, the Great War severely disrupts much of what those historians see as a development which was bent on a basically good part in national terms uh, and essentially uh, drove it into directions from which it never recovered. I wouldn't go quite that far personally, but I have some sympathy with, with that interpretation. Did the, did the uh, Australians fight with the French in, uh, on, um, in the trenches? Yes. Uh, yes, part of the British Empire, British Empire armies. Canadians, Australians, New Zealanders, South Africans, Newfies were all there as part of the various British Empire armies. Um, we rarely fought directly with the French in the sense of being ins inside French formations. We didn't do that at all. The language alone precluded that. Um, we did we did adopt some stray Americans in 1918, about a corps worth of you, uh, in the Second Corps, uh, who were brought in with uh, the Australian Fourth Division to act as, as advisors and mentors. I know these days the Americans are the one who take the advisory lead. Uh, back in 1917, 18 you badly needed help, and, and we were the ones along with some of the Canadians who were tasked to give it to you. And the Second Corps fought as part of the, the Australian formation in a number of actions from July through the end of the war. In what was apparently quite a, quite a positive um, relationship between both. Australians of, of that time knew much more about America than perhaps we think. I'm not sure Americans knew very much about us. But we knew a lot more about America than is sometimes thought. The reference to Jeff Stewart is one small giveaway for that. Uh, when they were debating uh, legislation about... Uh, entitlements for soldiers in the new Australian Army in the Parliament in the years immediately after Federation, they deliberately walked away from all-encompassing pension schemes and the argument was that we'd be mirroring the very, very expensive uh, outlays that the United States had at that stage with Civil War veterans. So there was actually quite a lot of awareness of what was happening in various parts of the United States at that time. There is a growing historiography looking at uh, colonial troops in World War One and particularly in the theater of Mesopotamia, um, because this is the primary theater where the British are going to deploy um, uh, troops of color in combat. Um, and that historiography tends to suggest that it was a nationalizing moment, it was an identity creation moment for a lot of those soldiers. Um, what do you, what's your interpretation of that? I think you have to be very careful with that one, so you, you don't take it too far. Um, I mean, with Indian troops, for example, uh, Indian units and formations have been deployed outside the subcontinent for decades. Uh, the British Indian Army was the strategic reserve for the world, basically, from the Suez Canal, the British world, from the Suez Canal to the Far East. And deploying uh, Indian soldiers to Egypt or, or elsewhere was quite a commonplace. So the fact of Indian soldiers being in these theatres between 1914 and 1918 is nothing new. What is new, of course, is that a much wider pool of Indian manpower is drawn upon for the wartime Indian Army. India recruits some two million men, not all of them go overseas. But they're drawing them more importantly from communities which were not those communities which traditional British military racial uh, theory described as martial races, like the Sikhs and the Gurkhas. That was where you recruited units of the British Army uh, and Dobras, but you didn't recruit them from, from uh, uh, Muslims in, in certain parts of Western India uh, and, and into Pakistan. There were groups within Pakistan you recruited from, but they weren't the ones that you needed when you expanded the army massively. This is all about the expansion of the empire armies and the compromises that the British authorities have to make. They've got a choice. You continue recruiting amongst martial races. You have no chance of recruiting an Indian army of two million men. You need a very large army, you have got to go beyond that. And it's the old thing, once you, once you do it, you can't undo it. You can't undo it. And so there are various then con conclusions drawn, particularly in the Congress Party in the 20s and 30s, 
about some of the older British assumptions about what does and does not constitute capability along racial lines. And you can see where the implications of that are going. It's a much longer process than the three or four years of deploying Indian units into Mesopotamia or into Egypt or into Palestine. I probably prefer to think of those as way stations on the path to an ultimate destination. Can I ask you a question on Vietnam? How many uh, can we stick to the Great War? <laughs> if the uh, Western Front was under a microscope, this front being so far on the fringes of military consciousness, did that help it or hinder it in this learning curve process, in this tendency towards combined arms? Being so far away, was that a, a good thing for the learning curve or a bad thing? I don't think the learning curve really really has a chance of being applied until the second half of the war. Um, the Dardanelles is a great disruptor. Uh, it's only really, and the British themselves can do acknowledge that in the course of 1916, uh, particularly when they're, they're feeling the inevitable complaints about those damn Australians and their complete lack of discipline. Um, <laughs> even Murray, who had no liking of Australians whatsoever, was prepared to admit that the Dardanelles had been the problem, that all these men, thousands and thousands of men, had been deposited at troop ships into, into Egypt. Uh, their early reception, they had not prepared sufficient camps and training grounds for them. So of course, what did they do? They unleashed themselves on Cairo. Uh, and then they were packed off within a, a matter of a couple of months, by which time they'd completed basic training, perhaps a little more, but not much. And they were sent to the Dardanelles. So they'd never actually had that time to acquire the disciplined and regular habits of soldiers. That process really only began for many of them once they were evacuated to Egypt. Uh, and so the learning curve or something else like it only really starts at that point. By then, of course, Egypt and other theatres are becoming the beneficiaries of the intense learning processes that are going on on the Western Front. And that really does become the doctrinal laboratory for the whole of the British Army worldwide. When Allen becomes and is able to bring out, because he's given a, a bit of a free hand in who he brings, and so he brings some people who have served with him, which is what senior officers everywhere do, people he knows, people he can rely upon, all of whom have been serving in senior capacities on the Western Front. They come in, helped by an admixture of, of more and more modern equipment, uh, and by large influxes of the training manuals, which are now being produced in their tens of thousands, to begin to bring the EEF up to the same sorts of standards and to and imbibe the same sorts of attitudes and understandings that have now become fairly regular amongst the formations that are fighting in France and Belgium. And by 1918, you can see that in the planning uh, for Megiddo and the way in which Allenby and his senior staff, particularly a very uh, gifted uh, staff officer named Bolts, who had, was a South African by birth, uh, you find Dominion officers in the British Army in all sorts of interesting places. Several of the senior commanders of British Army formations in Palestine are Canadians, uh, but they've joined the British Army as young men and have made their careers there. And Bowles is very much reflecting in the planning uh, the ways in which you'd attack uh, rupturing a major fortified position on an extensive basis that had been worked out in France in the preceding months allowing for differences in local terrain and conditions and the formations and so on, makes the necessary adjustments. But at the heart of it, it's taking those lessons, modifying them for local conditions, and then applying them successfully. And by, by the end of the war, that's working for them really well. As it is everywhere. Can you uh, 
serious uh, resistance by the Ottomans, and therefore they did not factor them in. If they did anything useful out there on that flank, that was good. But there was always the danger that they'd bite off more than they could chew, and then Allenby would have to divert resources that he needed for something else to go and rescue them. And for that reason, he made it abundantly clear, and this comes up several times in the last 18 months of the war, that he would not send a single soldier to the Arabs or down into the Sudan where there were other issues bubbling. Gold, yes. Weapons on a limited establishment, rifles, some machine guns, absolute artillery, not on your life. <laughs> <laughs> and that really, you know, what you do rather than what you say really says volumes about what you mean. Yeah. And the fact that he personally never placed any reliance upon them and recognised that they would become a very significant problem, as they immediately did, as the war's dying days were being fought out up in, in northern modern Syria, uh, where you know Faisal immediately asserts claims to an Arab kingdom of enormous proportions, uh, which nobody else had ever agreed to, although there is some suspicion that Lawrence may have, if not actively encouraged him in this, at least didn't pass on some of the more limiting uh, messages that were coming from his own command. And he understood, to give him his due, that Arab morale and sensibility was a very fragile thing, and that if you wanted to mobilize them for whatever you thought they could contribute, uh, you needed to understand what motivated all of them, not just those who were in it for the loot. Uh, you could say, in a sense, that Faisal was in it for the loot too, but he dreamed of loot on a national scale, uh, with himself on the throne. I think there badly needs to be a, a seriously objective account of the Arab revolt. I'm not quite sure how you do it now. Um, what I think is very interesting is if you look at, at the Arab historiography of the war such as it is, which really is a way of saying the Arab historiography of the early Arab nationalist movements post-1919, they pay no attention to Lawrence. He doesn't feature one, one, um, one British historian said recently, um, one really should retitle the man. The, the, the notion of Lawrence of Arabia is a misnomer. He's really Lawrence in Arabia. <laughs> and that's certainly how Arab historians see it, if they consider it at all. Uh, so that's another one of those, those myths with powerful legs yeah. that badly needs to be tripped up more regularly and often than, than it probably is. Could you uh, address briefly the historiography from the Arab side uh, as it has evolved since then, up to and including now, uh, particularly in light of the world events in terms of justification, not justification, etc., etc. Et Ooh, okay, this is now whole other lecture, um, <laughs> and I'm not I'm not an Arab specialist. In the way. Um, we talk about Arab historiography, we need to be careful. It's, it's not that sort of clearly delineated and, and mature body of writing that we would associate with that term if we were talking about the British historiography of the war or the American historiography of the war. Um, and it has its own myths too. It's very convenient for Arab nationalists, and they've been doing this for many decades, uh, to blame the Sykes-Picot Agreement of 1916 for everything that's befallen the Arab world since. Um, and while Sykes-Picot should not be given uh, a clean bill of health, uh, and certainly doesn't get off scops free, it's a little odd to be continuing to blame it as the source of all, all ills a um, hundred years after it was uh, signed, especially given much of it never actually was, it was, was promulgated. Um, it was originally an agreement uh, between Sykes and Pico, the, the British and the French delegates, and their now generally forgotten Russian counterpart who also signed it. And one of the key parts of this was not about the Arab world, the Russians couldn't care less about that, they wanted the Narrows. They wanted Constantinople back. Uh, back in the sense that Imperial Russia was the orthodox successor and inheritor to the Byzantine uh, inheritance, and they were very, very clear about that, at least at some levels. None of that, of course, happens. Other events are overtaken. And that's why I say it's a little bit, a bit rough to blame Sykes Pico for everything. It's usually, I think, shorthand for saying, oh, the post war imperial dispensation. Well, yeah, point taken, I point out to my students that um, 
The 14 points are a wonderful document, so long as you're white and speak a European language. Um, so, you know, national minorities do really well if you're a Czech or a Pole or a, or a, or a, 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 a Serb. You probably don't do quite as well as you're a Croat, and nowhere near as well if you're a Montenegrin. And they simply don't apply to Vietnamese or Indians or Koreans or Arabs. And that's made very clear to delegations from all of those entities when they come to Versailles, hoping to take benefit of what seems to be on the printed page, a pretty clear-cut ironclad endorsement. It doesn't work that way. And in that sense, yeah, you can say that the, the imposition of, of Anglo-French arrangements, which are really Anglo arrangements, the French don't, apart from Lebanon, don't get a lot out of the, the Middle East, certainly not anywhere near as much as they would like, uh, certainly contributes a lot. Um, it also, of course, tends to uh, obviate Arab responsibility for what they have done to themselves in the decades, certainly since the end of the Second World War, when it became very clear that the imperial dispensations were going to fold and fold pretty easily, and as they did. You know, they're, they're largely gone, certainly in direct influence terms, by the mid, mid late 1950s. So after that, it seems to me there's a balance sheet, and Arab writers tend to weigh very heavily on that side. And largely to, I don't really want to address that one, for reasons that I quite understand. I quite understand. Practicing history in some of those societies is a seriously life and threatening business if, if you do it the wrong way. Mm. Um, and I, but I fully appreciate, therefore, the, the ways in which you, you can and can't say things. But if we're looking at it from outside, and I think we need to at least acknowledge that that is a fact. One more question. Yeah. Yeah, I was curious in terms of Ottoman military operations. How did the famous name Mustafa Kemal, how did he factor in? Real in reality, because most counts he's like this national hero. He led, he seemed to have won the lip players, supposedly. I mean, I was what the reality is. Yes. Um, you, uh, dealing objectively with, with Kamal is very difficult uh, because, of course, he becomes Ataturk, the founder of the nation, uh, the savior of the Turks in the War of Independence, the first president essentially, effectively for life. Uh, although that's not it's the formal mechanism, but that's what, what happens. Um, and in Turkey itself, it's still the case that even under the current administration, which is trying to Islamicize rather than secularize, he's still largely a protected species. Um, and the, the, the Ataturk myth is very large. You go to the Dardanelles, the Turkish government has been building large numbers of monuments on the peninsula in the last 20 years. There are very few Turkish monuments before about 1990. There are now lots of them. And many of them are Kemal in some heroic pose doing something important. Uh, it's <laughs> worth remembering, therefore, that at the Gallipoli campaign, uh, Kemal was a colonel. Uh, even a very talented colonel, let's make no bones about it. Um, and he makes some decisive interventions at several key points on the morning of the 25th of April. Uh, subsequently, particularly during the initial days of the August offensive around Suvla, which are decisive in ensuring that whatever possibility there might have been of significant Allied advances were stopped in their tracks. That begs a much bigger strategic question, which again is a, 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 another, another discussion. Uh, subsequently, uh, he goes on to play various roles, but he's really important only in, in this sense, only again at the end of the where he's brought in when the Ottoman authorities essentially uh, Ottomanize all the command levels of the armies in Palestine and Syria. Uh, the Germans have been filling key command staff slots. Uh, some of those staff slots, they can do the commands are swept. And he comes in, and he's the one essentially when the whole thing collapses. And this is a, I suppose this is a, a 1918 version of those famous photographs of the retreat from Kuwait City in the one. That's uh, what's left of a Turkish column uh, that's been caught by aircraft and artillery uh, from the Allies as it's attempting to withdraw uh, in northern Syria. Um, he's the one who cobbles together what's left and is still in some sort of credible formation, pulls them together, manages to pull a couple of divisions out of this, gets them back over the border into Anatolia, and he's basically saying, if you want to keep coming, you're going to come through me. At that point, the EEF is exhausted, 
the ranks of the British Empire forces are being swept by uh, epidemic malaria and, of course, by the influenza pandemic. Uh, and I only learned this when I was writing the book, and you may not be aware of it, but whilst both may kill you, the two in combination probably will. And many of the, the disease fatalities in the last weeks and months of the war come from men, particularly in the mountain force, who have been serving in the Jordan Valley, which is a famously pestilential area for malaria, and then get influenza. And the combination of the two uh, works on each other as a sort of multiplying force. And uh, the re medical records at the time, some work done by medical historians more recently, shows them what an absolutely lethal combination that could be. So the, the forces are exhausted. They, they haven't got the offensive capacity to go to Manitoba. And it's just as well that the Ottomans have decided they removed the CUP from, from all effective governance in, in Constantinople, and they sued for peace. Uh, but then, Ataturk lives to fight another day. And he, of course, is not the only one. And his generation is well aware of that. It's subsequent generations that have wiped the memory of all those around him. And as my Turkish colleague Mesut points out, all of these Ottoman commanders, the ones who were effective in the First World War, and there are quite a few of them, many of them fight in the Dardanelles. And Western historians tend to say, ah, there you see, they forged these links and, and this common experience fighting at Gallipoli. And that's been alleged to give us you know, a, a common interest because we both find you know, the seeds of, of our modern identities in this one campaign. Well, maybe we do and maybe we don't. But the fact is, actually, that those links were forged in the Balkan Wars of 1912 and 1913, where these guys had all cut their teeth operationally and as staff officers. And although the Ottomans had, had lost very heavily in the Balkan Wars, they were the only major combatant nation of the six great empires that fight the First World War who had very recent operational experience at a high and large scale level within the last couple of years. And that's part of what gives them that effectiveness in the First World War, whereas Western historians are coming to recognize the Ottomans do far, far better for far, far longer than any contemporary observer in 1914 would have or indeed give them, did give them credit for. The Ottoman army, more often than not, until 1918, when its problems just become so manifest that it's falling apart, uh, until 1918 is still a very formidable proposition, particularly when it's fighting in the defensive. And Allenby, when he crafts his plans for Third Gaza and for the breakthrough of Megiddo, deliberately plays away from what he knows are known and perceived strengths, for precisely that reason. They really, really need some serious work in English to get out the, the, the reality of the Ottoman military experience, and frankly, I'm perfectly happy to put it in these terms, the reality of the Ottoman military achievement. Please join me again and thank you.